Welcome to Oil & Gas with Energy Law Prof. Today we're going to talk about why sometimes you have to sweat the details about these conservation rules because although in theory they're supposed to ensure everybody gets their fair share, a lot can often depend on those specific agency decisions and we're going to look at at that in the context of a case about spacing units. So first, let's do a little bit of a reminder about the administrative review process. So even if you lose in front of the oil and gas agency, now in your state, in Texas, that would be the Texas Railroad Commission. In uh, North Dakota, the North Dakota Industrial Commission. In Oklahoma, the Oklahoma Corporation Commission. Now, actually, a lot of states have more sensible names like the Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission or the Montana Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. And we'll look at examples like that. But in whatever agency you're front of, if you lose, you're able to challenge that in court. The challenge is that the court is typically going to defer to the agency on matters of its technical expertise. So you are going to have a difficult time if you're trying to explain to the court why the agency got the petroleum engineering wrong. On the other hand, if you can show that in some way they misconstrued the law that they were acting on, that's the kind of, that's the kind of decision that the court may be willing to grant you. So... Generally, the review is for substantial evidence, so the agency doesn't need to necessarily, you know, convince the court that if it was a petroleum engineer, it would have come to the same decision. It just has to show there was substantial evidence in favor of its decision. There's an ongoing struggle, you may remember this from legislation and regulation, between courts and agencies about really who should have discretion over certain policy matters. We're going to talk about this in the context of this case, Larson versus the Wyoming Oil and Gas Commission. It's from Wyoming, 1977, page 688 in your book. Now, in this case, the agency sets up 80-acre units, and each 80-acre unit gets one well. Now, it sets up a lot of uh, north, south, and east-west 80-acre units. Um, the appellant claimed, and I'm going to explain what this means in a second, that pooling in the north one half of the southeast one quarter did not protect Larson's correlative rights. So this is a case where we're sweating the details because, in fact, the different wells that are drilled in neighboring tracks had different amounts of production. And this one well, the Sherrard well, I'll show it to you in a second, had by far the most production. So the Wyoming Oil and Gas um, Conservation Commission didn't mention correlative rights and its owner, and that's the basis for Larson's claim here, and we'll explain what that means. So first, let's look at the map that's in your book at the end of the case, and I'm going to blow up that map. Look at the portion that I've highlighted there, kind of in the middle on the left of that. Now, let's blow that up and look at it, and the key property that we are going to focus on is this Sherrard well right here. So there's another Sherrard well below it, but you can see that because that's not colored in, that means that that is a dry hole. So that well, in other words, did not have any oil and gas. This is the key well that everybody wants a piece of. And as I said, you can see that the um, Oil and Gas Conservation Commission here mostly set up east-west. You can think of them as horizontal 80s throughout this field, but just neighboring here, it has one uh, that is north-south 80s. And we'll see that is relevant because the plaintiff here would have liked that set up better. So let's talk a little bit again about the theory. The theory is, you know what? Who cares where your well is or who you're sharing with? You're all pulling oil and gas from each other. And so if all the oil and gas was evenly distributed and each well had equal access and they were all drilled at the same time, we would all get the same amount of oil and that would be, uh, that would be wonderful. But in fact, it's more complicated. Here, the Sherrard well is the only well that's getting you know, the really huge amount of production. Now, I want you to understand a couple things about this image. What you're seeing in the shaded areas are where the appellant has is royalty interest. So Larson's royalty interests are in those areas. So you can see it's kind of a weird 
uh, shave. It's like almost like Tetris uh, here. But so that means that wherever that's shaded, if there's production that's allocated to that acreage, then that production will belong to the appellant. Okay, so you might say, why is the appellant complaining? The one good well is actually on a property where the appellant will share in that production. The problem is that the drilling unit here is set up east-west, as most of them are set up. And so you can see that the, uh, the appellant here, the plaintiff, Larson, only has a royalty interest on half of that land. And so the way it works is when the drilling unit is set up, that means that everybody in that drilling unit shares in the production from that well. So whatever the landowner royalty is, Larson's only going to get half of that because Larson only has a ownership interest in half of that land in that drilling unit. Now, now let's think about, we don't have a picture of this, but we know there's somehow oil and gas under the ground here. We don't know exactly where it is. If we were to guess where it is, well, we might say, you know what? I'm skeptical that there actually is any oil and gas on this part that Larson doesn't own because there's actually a well drilled very close to it and it was a dry hole. So there was no. So, so imagine that that oil under the land, maybe the oil reservoir is like this. And then you might think, well, from the perspective of Larson, the 80 should have been drilled, uh, should have been drawn to match that reservoir. Or maybe it's like that. And again, that would mean that Larson would get a full share in it because it would be fully included. Or again, maybe the reservoir is like that. Then again, you might ask, well, shouldn't Larson get a full share in that because Larson has a royalty interest in all that land? Now, maybe the reservoir actually corresponds with the drilling unit, in which case it seems very fair. In fact, in that circumstance, Larson is able to get the share and one half share production from the well, which corresponds to uh, Larson's one half of the reservoir. But Larson's point is we don't know, and it could be the case that in fact there is no oil and gas under this neighbor's property, which has been brought into this drilling unit with me. And so I'm forced to share with this person who, you know, only has only has a moose. Uh, you know, I, I love moose. I'm from Minnesota. That's a natural resource we have. We don't have oil and gas, but uh, doesn't have the same economic value as the oil and gas from the Sherrard well. So what would Larson have liked better? Well, Larson says there are some units here that have been drawn uh, in a north-south manner. So why didn't you draw mine in a north-south manner as well? So if you had done that, then I would have had a land interest in a royalty interest in all the land in the drilling unit, and I would have gotten a full share of production from the well, and I wouldn't have had to share with this landowner over here where I have no royalty interest. So that's um, Sherrard's position. It, that's Larson's position about the Sherrard well. You know, again, they could have all been north south units, still were, would have worked out because the drilling unit would have all been on land where Larson held a royalty interest. All right. So Larson brings this claim to Wyoming Supreme Court, and the court agrees with Larson. And the key here is the court doesn't say, oh, well, the Oil and Gas Commission didn't uh, measure correctly where oil and gas is. They're not, they're not arguing with the Oil and Gas Commission's technical expertise. What they say is, look, it looks like the Oil and Gas Commission didn't even consider this problem. And we'll see, this can be a very effective way to attack agency action, where you say, look, if they had exercised their expertise, okay, maybe you could defer to them, but they didn't even consider the issue they were required to consider under the statute. And so the court says the Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission didn't mention how much recoverable oil was in the whole pool versus under uh, Larson's land versus the neighbor's land. They didn't even look into this question. Now you might ask, why wouldn't the Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission look at that? Well, I do, uh, maybe, maybe you'll get a little clue from the court's other objection. The court also says the Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission 
cannot consider economic waste because the relevant statute doesn't mention economic waste. And now let's think about that. Why would the Oil and Gas um, Conservation Commission have mentioned economic waste? Well, if I were to generalize about these oil and gas conservation commissions, these oil and gas regulators, they tend to be more concerned about overall economic questions like, well, how much oil and gas can we get from this field? Uh, how many wells do we really need to produce all the oil and gas in this field? And they tend to be less concerned about, you know, does every individual landowner get exactly the amount of oil and gas under their land? Because that's kind of a, you know, a smaller question of incredible importance to the actual landowners, but maybe less important from the overall economic uh, view of society. And sometimes those uh, oil and gas conservation commissions tend to take that more economic approach. And so you can see these things as kind of linked, these two objections. So basically it seems like the Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission couldn't care less whether the individual landowners actually get the oil under their land because they say, you know what, it'll come out in the wash. We just want to make sure there's not too many wells and so we don't waste money uh, to extract all the oil and gas that we need. And we'll see that same kind of consideration arise in future cases. But I do want you to understand, look at how Larson was able to get the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission's decision overturned. It was able, Larson was able to say, one, they didn't consider something that they were supposed to consider, and Two, they considered something that they weren't supposed to consider under the statute. So those are both you know, questions about the law where the court feels very comfortable making interpretations and not questions just about the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission's technical expertise. That can be, can be much better to focus your challenge to the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission on its legal interpretations rather than trying to fight it on its own technical experience and expertise.